Now, Glenn sends his greetings. He is in California, suffering for Jesus. And uh, he's with our friends in Bayside in Sacramento. They've got their church conference, their Thrive Conference. So he's pre-recorded a little bit of um, a preach for us. And then we're going to be doing an interview with some very special people. But I want you to get your notebooks out, get your pens out, get ready with your, with your notes on your phone or whatever you do. But um, this is pure gold. So look to the screens. Church, we're going to deal with a really emotional issue of debt. This whole series is not designed to put any shame or to judge anybody in any way. One of the things that we really recognize is that financial literacy has never really been taught to us in our schools and through our education process. But we are so aware that there are rising amounts of personal debt in every family, in every home in the United Kingdom. Let's just make a decision today that today will be the beginning of getting out of debt. If you are in debt, today is a great day for you. We said this two weeks ago. We said that every miracle in the Bible started with a problem. Second to love, money is the most common topic in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7, that the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is servant to the lender. So if you have debt in your family, if you have debt in business, then you are really a servant to the person who's loaned you the money. Today, we're going to talk about dealing with debt. In a few moments' time, we're going to have an amazing interview with somebody who has recently come out of debt and how they did that. But firstly, let me give you six danger signs regarding debt. Number one, if you live on credit, it's a danger sign of debt. I'm talking about now, if you run out of money before you run out of month, then that is a danger sign of debt. Number two, if you delay payments or you only pay the minimum amount, that is a danger sign. Number three, if you are unable to tithe or you are unable to save, that's a danger sign of debt. Number four, if you are unable to pay your taxes. Number five, if you have extravagant spending. And number six, if you are constantly looking for get-rich-quick ideas. The Bible actually says about this in Proverbs 21 verse 5, that hasty speculation brings about poverty among other things. Let's just be honest with ourselves today. That today, if you are in debt, if you're watching online and you are in debt, you got into debt your way. Let's see if we can get out of debt God's way. Now, one thing we need to be aware of is this, is that the Bible doesn't promise that you can get out of debt quickly. You didn't get into debt quickly, and none of us will ever get out of debt quickly. But one of the thing I'm, things I'm super aware of is this, is that as God lowers your debt, He raises your character. So here right now, we're going to give you nine keys on dealing with debt. Key number one is this, commit to being debt-free now. Make the decision right now that you will live your life debt-free. You see, before we make our first payment, let's make a spiritual commitment. The Bible actually says this in Psalm 37 verse 21. It says, the wicked borrow and never repay. In other words, really what it's saying to us is that debt is a spiritual issue. And so the first step to becoming debt-free is to commit to it right now. To actually say, God, I want to do your will and I need your power. God, I want to do your will and I need your power. That's what we call willpower. Doing God's will with His power. You see, when you make a commitment to keeping in line with God's will, I believe that He brings His resources to help. I believe that one of the keys in this is delayed gratification. One of the reasons that we get into debt is because of an issue of trust. The Bible says that He will supply all of your needs. So right now, key number one to dealing with debt is to make the decision to commit to being debt-free right now. 
I want to pause for a moment on this point. And right now, where you are, would you close your eyes for a moment? I want to pray into this. And I want you to agree in your heart in this moment, if you are, have a life that's full of debt, I'm going to pray as together we commit to being debt free. Father, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. And God, we know that this plan and purpose does not need to include the weight, the heaviness of financial debt. So right now in this moment of prayer, as we agree in our hearts, as we commit to being debt free, I pray God that you would help us not just to be hearers of your word, but also to be doers to actually be able to implement the very things we're learning so we can live lives debt-free, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the second key to being debt-free is to make yourself accountable. I'm really now talking about getting somebody in your life who can become a coach. The United Kingdom coaching strategy for sport, it says this, it defines a coach as one that enables an athlete to achieve levels of performance to a degree that may not have been possible if that person was left to his or her endeavors. Make yourself accountable regarding the debt that you're in and the plan that you're about to make. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron and so one person sharpens another. The Bible says in Psalm 145 verse 4 that one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so the second key to living debt free is to make yourself accountable. Let me give you a list of some of the things that a coach will actually help you to do. Number one, a coach will help you to get clear about your goals and in finance, your financial goals. Number two, a coach helps you to identify your blind spots. The great thing about a coach is this, is that they're honest because they have no specific outcomes for themselves. They actually have your benefit at heart. And so they help you to identify blind spots in your life. The third thing a coach does is that a coach helps you to to stay accountable. They keep you on track. They keep you moving towards new levels. Accountability motivates. The, the, The next thing that a coach does is this, is that a coach helps you to focus your development efforts. In other words, they really help you to show where you need to focus your attention in the area that you need help and support in. Another thing a coach does is that a coach helps you to gain the competitive advantage. In other words, the coach enables you to get there quicker. And I think right now that if you're carrying debt, having some form of financial coach around you will help you to achieve the goal of being debt-free quicker. Another thing a coach does is that a coach helps you to acquire leadership skills. The way you become a leader is to lead yourself first. I actually believe right now that there are many people listening to this, watching this, you're in debt, but one of the things that you can know is number one, you can be debt free, and I believe that there are financial coaches just sitting there right now. You may be in debt, but one day you can coach somebody else out of debt as you make the choice to lead yourself first. Another thing a coach does is that a coach enables you to increase engagement. And lastly, a coach helps you to feel happier, to feel happier. The coach helps you to identify and align your values, create a focus, cut through the clutter. Simply put, a coach will help you to stoke your success. I wonder how much is that worth to you? So I just want to encourage you right now, if you're in debt, don't allow pride to stop you from getting the help that you need. Talk to a pastor. There are many programs, there are many ministries that can help you. CAP, as an example, Christians Against Poverty. Pick up the phone, talk to somebody, get a coach, and find some accountability to come around you in this endeavor to be debt-free. Again, I want to say this. You 
can be debt free. The third key to being debt free is a Bible principle, and it's simply this give to God first. Please don't shut off at this moment. Let's listen to what the Bible says. Because giving to God first doesn't make sense. But the thing is this, faith never does. If faith made sense, faith would not be faith. Some say to me, Glenn, I am so far into debt, I don't even know how to begin to give to God. Well, can I read you the verse from Malachi chapter 3? It says this, verses 8 to 10. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. The Bible is teaching us that tithing unlocks the door to God's power. And I believe that every single one of us need God at work, not just in our bodies, not just in our job, not just in our family and in our thinking, but I'm sure you agree with me right now that we all need God at work in our finances. Remember, second to love, money is the most common subject spoken about in the Bible. We need God and tithing unlocks the miraculous, powerful hand of God in our finances, in our money. The Bible teaches us in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23, that the purpose of tithing is to teach us always to put God first. And so I believe that when we prioritize God in our finances, as my wife and I have done for over 20 years of marriage, that tithing has become a key to activating the miraculous hand of God in our lives and in our finances. My friend, if you want God at work in your money, put God first. Put God first. The fourth key to getting out of debt is this. List all you own and all you owe. It's amazing to me, actually, how most people don't know what they have or how much debt they're in. So take out a pen and a paper, if you still have them, or use your computer, and write down, firstly, everything you owe. I'm talking about everything you owe to the bank, everything you owe to credit, everything you owe on, on store cards, utilities, uh, university loans. Write down everything that you owe. Now, it may uh, surprise you how much you owe, and maybe you need to drink a coffee and put some good music on while you do that. But why do you start with writing down everything you owe? Now you've done that. Write another list to everything that you own. What do you have? Write down your car. Write down your equipment. Go up into the attic. Go down into the basement. Go out into the garage, into the garden shed, and have a look and write down everything you actually own. The Bible says in Proverbs 24 verse 3, A house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. I think one of the reasons why people don't know what they owe is because, you know what, we're afraid to add it up. But when you actually write down what you owe, really what's happening in that moment is you are bringing fear into the light and you're offering it up to God to begin making practical steps on getting out of debt. Once you know all of this, once you know what you owe and once you know what you own, this is so key because now you can begin to take positive steps to get out of debt. So let me run these through with you again. Firstly, commit to being debt free. We've already prayed about that. Number two, make yourself accountable. Number three, give to God first. Number four, list all that you own and all that you owe. Here we go. Number five, the fifth way to deal with debt is to set up a repayment plan. 
a repayment plan. Listen, honestly, debt is like a sickness. If you had a sickness in your body, you would do everything you could do to get rid of that sickness. You would travel where you need to travel to. You would pay the money that you need in order to get that sickness out of your body. And I want to encourage you right now to think of debt in the same way, to actually commit to doing everything you can do to get out of debt. I want you to know that you didn't get into debt accidentally and you're not going to get out of debt accidentally. That with debt, you have to be intentional. You have to have a plan. Buying on credit is dangerous. It's like getting drunk and then having the buzz of the hangover. I want you to know that you can deal with the hangover now if you set up a repayment plan for dealing with it. And remember this, it's not the size of the plan that counts. It's starting your plan that counts. So make a plan and let's get it started. I want to give you four things that I think you can do regarding the repayment plan. There are four aspects of repayment plan that I think are really, really helpful for us. The first repayment plan is what we call debt stacking. Debt stacking. In other words, what we're doing is this, is we are aggressively paying off the smallest debt first. Then once that smallest debt has been paid off, you then take the full amount that you've been putting into that smallest payment every month, that smallest debt, and you then take that and add that to the minimum payment of the next debt moving up the line. And slowly you find that as you stack your debt, as you do the debt stacking, you're able to pay off one and then put all the monies into the second. You then have paid off two. You then put off all put all the money from both into the third and then into the fourth and then into the fifth. And one at a time, you are aggressively paying off your debt. It's called debt stacking. Let me give you a second key to setting up a repayment plan. And I think the second key within this is this, is pay off the debt that makes you the maddest. Like, I don't know which of your debts makes you the most angry, but you could actually start by paying off that debt first. Because when you think of that debt, you, your emotions rise, your anger increases. You can actually, you're actually spending emotional energy every time you think about that debt. So why don't you start there? Start by paying off what I call the angry debt. You know, there's also uh, another form of setting up a repayment plan that we call the envelope plan. In other words, what we do is this. We get our credit cards and we put our credit cards in one envelope and we actually draw cash from the bank and we put cash in the other envelope and we only ever spend the cash in that second envelope and never use the credit cards that are in the first envelope. That's the envelope plan. And a fourth repayment plan that maybe we could use is simply to actually get that financial counselor around you that we spoke about just a few moments ago, whether that be through CAP or a financial coach in some other way. And if we can help you with that as the church, then we would certainly love to do that. Remember, on our website, audaciouschurch.com forward slash financial wholeness, there are free downloadable tools and resources there. And if we can help you in terms of getting financial counselors around you, then please do email us with that. Set up a repayment plan. The sixth way to deal with debt is this, is to do it in half the time. Debt seems impossible. I know it does. I've spoken to many people who've had much debt, and you're going to see an interview in, in a moment's time about that. And when you see debt, especially increasing debt, it can seem impossible. But faith always sees things from God's perspective. Remember, the Bible says this in Luke chapter 18, verse 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so if it's true that debt is a spiritual issue, like we said a moment ago, then we need more than just a natural answer. Church, I want you to know that sin is a debt that God came to free us from. But equally, money that is debt 
we can also be free from. When we honor God with good stewardship, watch what He will do. I just want to say that again to you. When you honor God with good stewardship, watch what He will do. I know of many people in the life of our church who've set up debt repayment plans. Those repayment plans on paper, have been, they've been told that would last for 5, 6, 10, and even 12 years to get out of debt. But the people that I've been speaking to in the life of our church who are putting these principles into practice that we've been talking about, many of them have actually seen that repayment period cut down by half because they've seen God intervene and bring miracles in their finances. So I just want you to know that it is possible to do this in half the time when we honor God because God honors good financial stewardship. The seventh key to dealing with debt is to add no new debt. Let me say it again. If you are in debt, add no new debt. Because if you do, it's like a revolving door. I don't know, when my my son was little once, I remember him going into a hotel through a revolving door and he just found himself. He was walking around in circles, just following the door. Debt is like that. If you have made a plan to get out of debt, make a decision to add no new debt. A few weeks ago, on the first weekend of this series, we talked about controlling our desires. Two weeks ago, again, we spoke about that whole aspect of of, of debt. And I want to encourage you, add no new debt. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verses 5 to 6, don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have. Since God assured us, I'll never let you down. I'll never walk off and leave you. We can boldly quote, God is there, ready to help. I am fearless, no matter what. Who or what can get to me? In the interviews that we did two weeks ago, we had a moment where we prayed and we talked a little bit about needs versus wants. Needs versus wants. And I guess it's true that for many of us who've got into debt, we got into debt because of wants. It was wants that we just simply added to the debt pile. It's really important that we add no new debt in this season of getting out of debt. The eighth key to dealing with debt is to talk with those you owe money to, the creditors. Talk to them. Listen, do you ever dodge calls? Do you ever uh, have your phone at home ring or your mobile phone is ringing and you know who it is and you make the decision, I'm not going to answer the phone because I am dodging the creditors. Can I just say this, that the eighth key to dealing with debt is to talk with those you owe money to. Stop hiding. Talk to your creditors. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 7, when a man's ways please God, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. We heard just two weeks ago in our interview with Rachel Ray. Rachel said this, that one of the things that her and her husband Rob did is they talked with their creditors. They talked with those they owed money to. When you talk to your creditors, it's quite amazing how at times sympathetic they can become and how changes can be made. Tell your creditors what you can pay, how much you can pay. They want your money. They don't want you to go bankrupt. Because if you go bankrupt, they won't get their money. They may want 300 pounds a month from you, but if you can only pay 30 pounds a month, tell them. Say to them, look, here's my problem. Here's my plan. Here is how much I can pay per month. Will you work with me through this time period? I want you to know you can also talk to your creditors about lowering the interest rate that you pay. If you have credit cards, if you've uh, taken uh, short-term loans that have turned out to be long-term loans with high interest rates from some lenders that you've seen on TV, you can speak with them and ask them to lower your interest rates. 
We know many people who've done that. Many friends have done that. Many people in our church have simply been that honest. Remember, God can help you with favor. Can I repeat the verse that we've just looked at? Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. God can help you with favor with your creditors. So God, I take this moment right now to pray for every single person who in their heart have already made a commitment to be debt free. I pray, God, that in this season, as they make a debt repayment plan moving forward, give them favor with their creditors, I pray in Jesus' name. The ninth key to being debt free is this. Stick to it and trust God. Stick to it and trust God. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Listen, church, I want you to know that God won't get you out of debt quickly, but He can get you out of debt. And unless you develop your character on this journey, then you're simply going to go back into debt. Every single one of us in this journey of becoming debt-free have to become a different person on the inside, different to the person we were when we ended up in debt. I want to encourage you, don't get discouraged. The Bible says we will reap a harvest. Debt is a prison that keeps us bound. It keeps our emotions bound. It keeps our thinking bound. It keeps our mental health bound up. It is like a prison. And I want you to know, Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So I encourage you to find that plan, work with the plan, stick with it, and trust God. Because here's the thing. Every single one of you watching this right now can be debt free. You can be debt free. Make a commitment to follow God's financial plan. Set a date and make a faith statement. Put it on your fridge. The Bible says this in Habakkuk 2 verse 2. Write down the revelation and make it plain so that you can run with it all the days of your life. You can be debt free. Make a commitment to follow God's plan. Set a date and make a faith statement regarding it. Church, I want you to know that all of these messages in these series, they're available on our YouTube channel, Audacious Church. They're also available on podcast as well for you to listen to and listen to again and again. Don't forget audaciouschurch.com forward slash financial wholeness. And there are free tools, downloadable uh, tools for you to use to help you in this journey of being debt free. You can be debt free. I believe it. God speaks about it. The friends sitting around you have confidence in God, in you, in this season for you to become debt free. Church, let's be a debt free people. Let's live, live debt free lives so that we can be blessed to be a blessing to our city and our community. Church, I love you. I believe in you. And I know you are going to really love this interview that we're about to have right now. See you next weekend. We are Paul and Zoe Reed, and we um, oversee pastoral care here at Audacious Church. So anything people related, um, life groups, people who are new to faith, baptisms, all that stuff, that's us. We have an amazing team, though, of like a squillion people. So right, it's yes. It's not just you guys. Then. No. <laughs> so um, we love these guys, but we just need, would you just share with us, what, how, how did you get to the point of knowing you had a problem with debt? Because we know that there's good debt, there's bad debt. You know, most people who have got a job, who own a house. But, but how, how did you know that this was an issue? I think when something is so consuming that it is the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning and the last thing you think about before you go to bed, then whatever that is, be it debt or anything, actually, that is a that's a warning sign, that that's a danger moment. And um, that's, that was the situation for us. We were in such a situation that it was all-consuming. All of our mental 
real estate was given to that and, and, and more than we even had. We were overdrawn mentally and emotionally as well as, you know, at the bank, so. Okay, so we know that obviously you're saying this was all consuming, but could you tell us how this kind of uh, affected home, relationships, marriage, uh, work? Yeah, yeah, everything. We need to have everything together, which just isn't the case at all. Um, and our home was sometimes quite tense, but to be honest, a lot of the time, we kind of got on with it and tried to make it all okay and tried, that was in the back of your mind all the time, but just tried to make it family. And But it was tense sometimes between us two. It was a little bit sometimes, especially when it was the weekly shop. That, that the was weekly tense. shop, yeah. tense moment. I'd often ring him, it's been declined. The card had been declined. Yeah. yeah. That is the moment. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Horrible. I think um, a good way to describe it now, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to say it back then, but I think um, we just slipped completely into survival mode. So um, we got into debt because we were trying to survive. You know, it was like a perfect storm of huge stretch in expenditure uh, and at the same time, a reduction in income. And so we got into debt because we were trying to survive. You know, we weren't extravagant spenders. I know that was one of the things that Pastor Glyn mentioned. That wasn't us. But we really had too much month and not enough money. We bought a new, we moved house. We had our second child um, and, and my income reduced all at the same time. And so we just got into this survival mentality that got us into the situation. But once you're in it, it's all that you see. You know, surviving the next 24 hours without a call from, from Zoe at the supermarket or a call from a, a creditor or just this like whole plate spinning scenario of just trying to do all that is so consuming. You don't really have space to think about anything else. You know, the idea of increase or vision or, or, or strategy even of getting out, let alone, you know, possibility, is just not on the page. It's not that we you know, were greedy or selfish. It was literally just survival mode. Got to get through, got to get through, got to get through. That's like living in a state of high alert all the time. It's exhausting. Exhausting. And how did it affect your relationships? Because obviously, um, you know, people wanting to go out, people wanting to, to do things. How did that affect? Yeah, it really affected it. We'd recently started to come to this church as well and wanted to build new relationships with people. And we had the opportunity to like, people would be inviting us out all the time, but we kind of had to say, no, no, we, we, we can't come, sorry. So it kind of made relationships quite difficult really to, to start new relationships because we didn't do anything social. Sure, I mean, it was a filter, like any kind of consuming issue, it's the filter which you view everything through and that's true of your relationships. And so I would project onto people judgment, you know, feeling that they were judging me, which was totally unfair because they, they didn't know um, and, and therefore didn't even have the choice whether to judge me or not. But I just assumed, you know, you kind of live three steps down the line, like this person, they're going to get to know us, they're going to find out, then they're not going to like us. So we may as well just cut out the middle section and just go, these people don't like us, there you go. You know, and that was the filter through. And, and if you know me as a person, that is a terrible way to live because I love people and I love, you know, the whole idea of church being family and stuff like that. So it was, it was definitely turbulent emotionally for us in that yeah. sense. And did you pick that up, church, that it became a lens in which, you know, they saw everything and they, they actually, um, you know, put words or put thoughts in other people's mouths, you know, they, they assumed that people, you know, were judging them even though they didn't even know what was going on. So can you tell us what the catalyst was? What was, I mean, a lot of people live in debt because, or bad debt and that crippling debt um, for a long time because it's so shameful, like you said, you were embarrassed. So there must have been something, a catalyst that happened in order to bring that to the light so that you could actually deal with it. Yeah, I was at um, the ladies' conference here um, and... Um, a lady was... That's Luminous, which is yes. next month. Yeah. Um, and, 
a lady was sharing about how she um, was praying for her daughter to come back to Jesus, and, and she was consumed by that, and God spoke to her and told her to stop praying. And that, at that moment, I really felt God speak to me because the whole debt was consuming everything. That was all I prayed about. It was all I thought about. In my mind, the debt was bigger than God, and I really felt challenged when that lady spoke that I needed to stop praying about debt I need, because I needed to make God bigger in my mind than the debt. So I, I did. I totally stopped praying about it and just started to pray differently. I was very self-righteous. I was like, <laughs> we won't be stopping praying, love. You know, like that kind of leader kicked in. But in actual fact, that revelation was, was a major, well, was the um, catalyst because we then prayed with thanksgiving every time we prayed and and really so he re-educated me and our kids in how we pray and so now our kids when they pray they don't say god you know please will you do this they start by saying god thank you that you are which is sounds like you know just a little different way of saying it but it's a different um, position of your heart it's a different posture isn't yeah it? absolutely Absolutely. So that was an internal shift that happened. Suddenly faith came and you were like, okay, I need, this, is, this needs to, um, you know, God needs to be bigger than my debt. But what was, was there an external thing that happened that brought it to the light as well? Well, I mean, circumstances were, were tough. You know, I, we had two kids, two boys, and desperately, perhaps me more than Zoe at, at, at the time, but just desperately wanted another child because I wanted that little person right there <clears throat> to be in my life. So um, we were just like, I was just like really desperate and just, you know, and um, I'd never talked to anyone about it. And um, I was sat at my desk in the old building in, my, in the, uh, you could call it an office. Some people call it a cupboard. Um, uh, we all remember those offices. And I had a letter from a creditor in my hand and I was reading it and it was, I didn't know what to do. And I was, you know, and then Pastor Stewart came in um, and said, what's that? And so I kind of like stuck it under the desk and just, you know, did physically what I had metaphorically done for so long, which was just, you know, hide, shame, don't worry, I've got this, I can do it type thing. Uh, and I just, you know, after this revelation and that, I was like, okay, I, this, I can't do this anymore. Um, and so Stuart, I said, here it is. And I told Pastor Stuart, he sort of frog marched me into Glenn's office, not cross at me, but just like, this is, you shouldn't be living like this. Um, and just, I just, just said it. I just made myself accountable, which is obviously one of the points from Pastor Glenn's message. Um, and it, it, those two things, the revelation and the um, understanding the power of, of meaningful, life-giving relationships, that's what what kick-started the process of us getting out of debt. Brilliant. So, um, Glenn talked about bringing the fear out into the light. Yeah. And then you can actually make a plan. So, uh, the plan. At that point, you started a plan. And I loved what Glenn said. He said, it's not the size of the plan that matters. It's actually just starting the plan. So, how did that, what was that like for you guys? Well, we went to um, CAP, which is Christians Against Poverty, which is what um, Pastor Glenn spoke, spoke about. Um, and they, you, you fill in lots and lots of forms and things like that, and you set up a plan with them. They contact all your creditors and, and set up your payment things. Um, so we did what we could do, and we paid. Paul got an extra job working evenings. I went back to work, working in a school. If she says evenings, she means all night. <laughs> all right, all night. Go on. And um, so we, we did what we could do. And um, the plan was to, um, set up to, and it would take us 12 years to get out of debt. But um, God did lots and lots of things, and it took us four years to get the debt free. I love that. I think that was really key what you just said, Zoe. You said we did what we could do, and then God could do what He can do. Because that, that point that Glenn was saying, you know, you put God first and then watch will he'll, what he will do. When you live inside out, which is the revelation takes place first, it's amazing what you can do. It is amazing what you can do. I would go to uh, a job on a Saturday evening at 10 o'clock 
I would work all night till six o'clock, go home, I had half an hour before I had to be up, so I'd just crash on the couch for half an hour, then get up, get dressed, get sorted, come to church. We were doing power breakfast. Do you remember power breakfast? Here at church, it was like a class in the morning before church, which I was teaching. So I would be like just literally going, just absolutely going for it, just getting all this stuff done after, after having no sleep. Um, and just this, the, the Holy Spirit and just the grace of God enabled us to do so much more than we could even imagine doing in our own strength. Well, I just want to thank you for, for being so open and honest about your journey. No problem. Church, don't you appreciate the, the honesty? Praise God. We, we love you so much. But I want you to talk to people who may be in that situation now. What would you, what did you need to hear before all, all of this happened and it got really bad and it all came to light? What would you say to somebody who was in that situation before that? Um, I think the two ingredients we've mentioned, revelation and relationship, are key. And so um, revelation is when God shows you something that he's hidden, especially for you not from you because he's mean but for you because he loves you and you need revelation from God as to um, how valuable you are how shame and guilt um, is not from God um, the idea that you got yourself into this mess you got to get yourself out of it all of that, that way of thinking really can only be broken by by revelation so um, good and the way you get revelation is is not a new idea and it's not you know a new strategy this is what it's been about since the dawn of time it is just intimacy with God yeah. and there's so many things that you know we can do to be intimate with God and and so just just put God first and not praying about your finances or your addiction or your seemingly failed relationship whatever it is just put God first and just and just love God and just allow him to love you and receive that. I know it sounds twee, but, but it's, it really is powerful. That's that revelation, because from that comes strength. Then you're able to do the second thing, which is relationships, is you've got to go and talk to someone. Like, talk to us if you want to. Um, talk to your life group leader, talk to your regional pastor, talk to um, you know, some of the team here at church, because we um, represent um, the church as in capital C church, you know, God's put us on planet earth to be in community and, and, and that's what I would say, those two things. Great, well, we're gonna pray, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna get these guys to pray for us, church. Um, but I felt uh, I've got a word for somebody and uh, I, I'm not gonna ask for, your, for you to, to kind of say who you are, but I'll tell you what I heard while I was side of stage. I heard that phrase that we've heard so many times, everybody knows it. You made your bed, now you lie in it. You made your bed, now you lie in it. And I don't know if somebody has told you that about your debt or it's something that you are saying to yourself and that's what's stopping you from actually getting help. I made my bed and now I've got to lie in it. But I just really felt that the Holy Spirit was saying, we're getting out the fresh sheets we're getting white, fresh sheets. We're taking that stuff off and we're making a brand new bed for you to lie in. Praise God. Because it's a new day. It's a new day. God is doing a new thing. 